Good evening, everyone, and welcome virtually to United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. I'm Jennifer Oz Freeman, the Assistant Professor and Program Director of Theology and the Arts at United. Our events this year are under the larger theme, What Do You See?, which is an expression of our belief that the arts are uniquely powerful and transformative, envisioning a better future and bringing it into existence. Our next event under this theme will be a conversation between the artist Ricardo Levens Morales and our own professor Gary Green on October 26th at 7 p.m. After the talk this evening, there will be some time for Q&A, so I'll ask that you keep your mics muted until then, um, and then we can open it up for a conversation in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So it's my pleasure to introduce Benedict Scheuer, who is an interdisciplinary artist who views gardening and nature as the spiritual center of his practice. His work spans drawing, painting, sculpture, video, performance, singing, and textiles. What don't you do, Benedict? <laughs> he values a non-prescriptive approach to engaging with his work, allowing color, texture, shapes, and narrative to engage with each viewer uniquely. Death, love, connection, mindfulness, and cycl. So you're, gonna, <laughs> cycle, you're gonna have to help me pronounce that word. Cyclicality. Cyclicality. <laughs> That's a great word. Cyclicality are often warmly encountered. Benedict recently received his MFA in visual art from the Ohio State University and holds a BA in environmental studies from Yale University. His talk this evening is titled Artist and Ecosystem, Spirituality, Looking, Flowers, and Making in the Garden. Welcome, Benedict. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much for that introduction, Jennifer. Um, and yeah, before I start digging into this little presentation that I have, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, really appreciate the support and just being here. It really means a lot. And I'm excited to share what I do have to share tonight. So yeah, thank you for being here. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to thank Jennifer um, for helping spearhead and organize this. Um, we originally started talking about this um, through my uncle John, who's in the audience actually. Um, he was able to connect us, um, and as a result of that, this talk has come out of it, and hopefully um, an exhi exhibition um, coming next year, but uh, fingers crossed for that. Um, and I also wanted to thank just my uncle John for facilitating that connection. Um, so yeah, with all that said, um, I also wanted to mention, um, as I know that uh, United Space er, is in uh, Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota, so I wanted to share that. Um, and the reason that I wanted to share that specifically is that there is because there's a particular type of quiet that I think is really um, special and unique to sort of the Minnesota landscape and the lakes up north specifically. And that landscape and that space is one of the first quiets that I really came to um, fall in love with and I think started accidentally experiencing these moments of mindfulness in a way that is really um, I think has trickled into the work that I'm making today. So I wanted to share that as a way to segue into talking about the work but also just to find a point of connection for anyone out there who might um, who might have that might have resonated with. So um, as Jennifer mentioned the talk today is titled Artist and Ecosystem and I'm going to be hitting on all of these categories um, that are on the screen here. Um, on the image on the left, you can actually see one of my favorite places to work, which is just right outside the garden, on the ground, on this little cement area in the carport. <laughs> um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as we keep going, but um, yeah, here we go. Okay, so um, I thought a lot about what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I thought I could talk really descriptively about my work and kind of what I'm hoping my work to do, but I thought that what would be more helpful is to actually go into detail and talk about how I view or what I view my role as an artist to be, um, specifically as it has related to gardening in the past three years. And there's a lot in there um, to unpack and a lot of things that I want to share. Um, before I do that, I think it's important to recognize that if you are an artist or someone, this is just kind of my personal, this is my personal way that I'm finding and it's not a prescription for uh, anyone else necessarily, but I, I'm open to that, of course. But I think that, um, yeah, this is just one of the many ways of, of going about the world and doing your things. So 
Um, this image that I have pulled up for us first is a painting that I made um, this past year. Um, and I wanted to show it first because for me, it's really an honoring of the garden that my work is really about. Um, the way that I experience this work is kind of, is the same sensations in a lot of ways that I'm experiencing while I'm out working in the garden. Um, and it's an actual depiction of the garden landscape that um, I'm referencing in this talk today. And you can see in the background, very small, um, a little house and a little carport, which was pictured on that first slide. And there's two little shovels there as well. Um, one is mine, and then one um, was my partner at the time. Um, and so we're kind of nestled into this landscape space and surrounded by a million things happening. Um, and so I wanted to start with that image. And um, just one last little thing about it is that I wanted to share about this particularly is that it was made in the garden in a unique way and that it's this massive piece of paper that's 66 inches by 44 inches wide that got brought out into the garden and there's something special about that because the way that that paper lies into the contours of that earth helped shape where the watercolors first initially started cooling. In there. So I think about the way that this image is intricately connected to that space in a way that I think is really important um, to recognize. Um, so as I'm thinking about what my role as an artist is and trying to identify um, kind of what is my job in a way, um, I've come to this expression or the statement, I guess, that I put here in words, um, and it's connecting to a multi-species world. Um, and so just to break that down a little bit, when I'm talking about connection, Specifically, I'm talking about two forms of connection. One is very physical. Um, it's this material, matter, or material matter way of connecting to something through touch or through a physical exchange. Um, but then there's also a metaphysical connection. And that is far more difficult to talk about. And I'm going to do my best to talk about it. Um, and for me, I often refer to that sort of me metaphysical connection as the spiritual. Um, but I think that as we go through the talk, kind of what I really mean will shake itself out and you'll see what that looks like. And so going back to the centerpiece here, connecting to a multi-species world, we also have um, the term multi-species world. Um, and so I'm actually think I'm thinking specifically about the garden, but I don't think that term is not limited to the garden space. And I'm actually borrowing it. Um, from Anna Singh, who wrote The Mushroom at the End of the World. That's where she's most um, famously known for. Maybe people have read that book. Um, but it's a term that she uses in her book. And when she's writing, she talks about how humans shape multi-species worlds when our living arrangements make room for other species. Um, and so what this can mean, as an example, um, an example that I'm really fond of is in Yellowstone National Park, um, they reintroduced wolves into the park system. And this made kind of drastic changes in rebalancing of this ecosystem. It encouraged elk to be more alert and moving more constantly. As a result of that, they weren't able to decimate willow stands that um, grew along the rivers there um, to such a degree. As a result of that, willow stands became healthier and beaver populations were able to recover, so on and so forth. And I think that example gives space for um, non-human species making room for each other. Um, but it's not limited to that. And we can also think about um, more human-centered, not centered, but human-related examples, um, such as humans, specifically indigenous peoples, uh, burning landscapes to take care of them, right? And to protect them and to also manage them in a way that was healthy for the entire ecosystem that was there. So in understanding this multi-species world that I'm speaking to, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, what my idea of wilderness is specifically and how that relates back to um, how I'm thinking about the garden space. So I'm gonna take you back to this image, which is from 2015. Um, I'll talk about that image in just a second. So in America, it's super common to think about wilderness as a space that is untainted by humans. Uh, we see this as evidenced in the Wilderness Act um, of 1964 and the language that they use in that specifically is creating spaces that are like block off human um, impact. Um, this mentality, while I think 
um, really romantic at first is one um, is one of the reasons that the national park system strongly displaced a lot of native populations, um, kind of skirting them off of the land, pushing them off of the land because wilderness is a place by this definition um, that is not to be touched by humans, right? And so as a result of learning about this specifically in my undergrad experience, I started questioning my own ideologies a little bit and what is wilderness to me um, and what can wilderness be to me? And so I've started um, I've just kind of erased that binary from my life. I don't view wilderness as a pure space, as in, as in it's untainted by humans. I really think of nature and humans as um, existing um, in that same sort of a plane, if that makes sense. So if I were to give an example in this image here from a project that I completed along uh, Lake Superior, actually, on a series of black and white self-portraits in 2015, um, I'm kind of playing with that idea. And so here we have my back, which has either become an island or maybe um, the sun that's poking up over the horizon um, or vice versa, right? The sun becoming a back is also an idea, is a beautiful thought um, to consider in the contemplation of an image like this. Um, in addition to that, um, another example here, my nipple has become a wildflower. And that's just a result of like really simple juxtaposition of like light and shadow um, to kind of poke at this idea. In these next two images here, they're from a similar series of work that I created. I'm playing with similar ideas. I'm just kind of shaking things up a little bit. Um, we have on this left image, my arms entwining with this plant here, and we have my body um, being both interrupted and consumed and also just wrapped, wrapped into this tree trunk here. Um, and so this particular series, you utilized a, um, a series of flashes of light. So it's not a digital manipulation by any means. It's actually um, a light that I bring out into the woods with me and use when photographing. And it casts this like red or whatever color, to be honest, um, light. And it allows for these um, forms to merge together in one plane of color. Um, so playing with that idea there too. Um, and the title of this project, I think, is just is, uh, is related to this all too. And it's the title is Limb, um, and I chose that for the title specifically because of it's it's a playful word to use. It's both an arm and a branch simultaneously, um, and that's what this work was about. Um, so this understanding of wilderness that really shaped how I uh, viewed my connection to the garden space. Um, has really shaped my connection to the garden space. And I don't view the garden as a distinct entity for me. Um, I really view it as a mesh into my existence, both physically and metaphysically. Um, yeah, so I've, um, I'm, I, I don't know if I can ask if anyone has questions right now, but if anyone did, I'd be happy to clear up anything if anyone did. You can definitely okay. ask questions along the way or pose, yeah, you could, you know. You can use the time however you like. Great. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone does, otherwise I'll keep going forward. I just get worried. I the the way that I'm thinking through things might not translate for someone else. So if you if you want to uh, me to clarify anything, just let me know anytime. So cool. Um, so we'll dive into this next set of images. Cool. So we're diving into the garden now a little bit. Finally, we're getting in there. Um, so the garden. This multi-species world that I brought up, um, the space of the hour, um, it's never stagnant. Um, it's, a it's a performance that never stops. There are a million things happening in there all at once. And they're never just, yeah, they're never just um, totally not active, right? And that's true even in the depths of winter. Um, and one of my favorite parts of that whole cycle um, is physical matter as it, it builds up over time in the heat of summer and eventually it does what it needs to do and it starts to wither down um, and it returns itself to the soil through decomposition. Um, the sculpture that is in these images here speaks to that idea in a few ways. Um, resting on this grave, there are two sunflowers um, that we grew about 14 feet tall 
Um, they're a bit like lovers. They're dry, um, dead, and they're stoned together at the face, which is a little bit morbid. But um, and the rest, and they rest on a funeral pyre sort of structure, or what could be one. Um, the making of the structure is actually just because I think um, it's kind of curious. Um, the structure was made by digging a, a bed, a hole, a trench into the garden itself, as seen in the, the picture on the right here. Um, and I placed these boards in there to kind of divide up um, the sculpture into multiple pieces. Um, <coughs> and that's just because I cannot carry um, heavy, huge pieces of plaster by myself. Um, and so plaster is poured into the ground. It takes the texture of the earth there, and it also becomes a negative image of this hole, which I think is kind of a, which I think is interesting as it relates to the cycle that this plant has had, where it started in the ground, it came out, um, it has died and it's returning, and now as it is dead, it floats on this pyre that has, is made from the negative space of, of where it came from. Um, and I'm really um, bringing up this conversation about death and giving over this one's whole body. Um, like that's a really extreme example of um, connecting physically to the garden, right? It's totally enmeshed in there. It's totally giving up its body. Um, and then in a really extreme and profound way. And I would like to also say that I'm connecting to that space as well, this garden space through this process of making, but also um, through a variety of means. So for starters, um, I am spending time in the garden. I'm sitting in that space, I'm taking it in with all of my senses, um, and that is a daily occurrence. And so it's really not unlike this photograph here where I'm sitting in the garden. Um, for anyone curious, this photograph is made through a process of re-photographing photographs. Um, and so sort of creating a, di a, a diorama that plays with um, light fixtures and then photographing that diorama and then printing it, manipulating it further, re-photographing. So you get this effect of trompe l'oeil where things look like they're coming off of the page, but they're not um, in reality. So just that's how this process is made. I just wanted, to, just because it is a little confusing <laughs> to look at, I think. Um, yeah, so one way of connecting the garden, just existing within it. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, watering, digging, weeding, planting, fertilizing, composting, uh, saving seeds, protecting things from frost heat pests. There's a lot of tender touch that happens out in the garden space as a form of connecting to it. Um, in addition to that, there's also this really beautiful um, intake that um, someone who grows a garden or eats from a garden gets to experience. And this cheeky little tomato here, if I eat that, it becomes a part of my body. Um, the nutrients break down, they get rebuilt up into certain parts of me in ways more complicated that I'm going to understand or explain today. <laughs> uh, but that's what's happening. It's really um, kind of incredible. And so like this, um, but like the dying sunflower, I am also giving um, resources that are coming directly from my body. Um, so from my own body is coming like CO2, right? Um, saliva. If I go and pee in the garden, which is a thing that happens trying to keep um, groundhogs out of there. <laughs> um, and also shedding hair, skin, dust, blood, sweat, all of these things are becoming a part of that ecosystem too. And a lot of that is unintentional on my end. Um, and so I really am curious about that physical exchange of materials. And for me, ingesting food, um, bugs accidentally, uh, bacteria, water, whatever, and me being able to give something back um, from my own physical body or from um, just through a tenderness of touch and care is really, really profound. Um, and I think that it really begins to blur the distinction between the individual self and this larger ecosystem. Um, when you can look at a bed of flowers and be like, oh, I'm in there somewhere. And I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's really profound. Um, I'm going to jump to another slide here as sort of a segue and sort of a summary of um, those points that I've just been making. Um, but I'm going to show a two minute clip um, that has a slow build. Um, 
and we'll move on to the next thing after that. And I'm hoping that the sound will work on your end, but we'll find out. Um, is there audio for you all? Okay, I will do this. And let's see if that works. It's pretty quiet audio, but okay, great. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna. Can you all still hear me if I don't use these headphones? Okay, great. So thank you for watching that. I feel like that was the moving image summary of like the past few slides. So we're gonna move forward from there. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so. Looking to this image here, it's made in a similar process as that sort of green, like laughing, hysterical self portrait that I showed you earlier. Um, so um, we've dug into like the physical ways of connecting um, that I see myself in in the garden. But now I want to dig into that which I consider a little bit more serious. Um, and that's the metaphysical means of connecting. And this is where I start saying, like, this is like the spiritual um, space. And the exchanges that are happening here for me are in the realm of sensation. So feelings, emotion, um, that sort of thing. And a lot of the times it begins with the eyes, um, as we see in this photo here. Um, so there's some beautiful things that I want to tell you all about eyes because I think that um, I think they're important to understand what I'm doing. So I'm gonna dig into that. Um, so this here, these photos are not taken from me. I got them from Wikipedia, um, from Wikimedia user Tango22. Um, that's a joke, but it's also serious. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so these are limpets. And I don't know if you've seen limpets before. These are not limpets at all. Partic this particular species, I think, it, it like lives in around whales. But um, the ones I'm familiar with are from the Pacific Northwest when I was working out there. And the really cool thing about limpets is that they have amazing eyes. They're very, very simple. Um, you can't see them in this photo, but here are some like little antennas, but their eyes are actually um, like cups. So they don't have a closure on the top of them. They are this open space and ocean can come into it and wash it out. Um, and the receptors are on the bottom that are sensing the light. So over time, as like evolution occurred and eventually humans occurred, by the time we got around, like our eyes were, for us, our eyes are enclosed, right? We have 
not only can we like totally close them with our eyelids, but that we have a lens, we have a pupil um, to like let only light in there really is the goal. Um, and so I just wanted to one, like relate back to this like very simple way of seeing, which I like to think about as a way of seeing as if your entire eye is the ocean. Um, that's a very romantic way of looking at it, but that's how I look at it. And um, as this eye sort of started enclosing, right, we still needed that ocean with us. And so we have tears um, that serve that same function of the ocean, right, where we're washing out the sediment from our eyes. Um, and so the most important part of this explanation, a lot of that was just because I think it's awesome, but the most important part here is that we have an enclosed eye. Um, and that's relevant as we keep trucking forward. So we know kind of like, we know our eyes are enclosed. Um, it's more like a container than a cup. Um, and we have this process of seeing, but what is really happening in seeing? I'm going to break it down really basic. And I think that in that, in breaking it down really basic, we get to understand how kind of incredible this entire process is. So first we have the big beautiful sun and it is emitting like all of this beautiful waves of light, right? And these waves of light, some of them are coming down through, not all of them, just the lucky few are coming down to earth. They're breaking through the atmosphere and they're bouncing off something. So if we were to look at somebody diving as we see in this image here, that light's gonna be hitting off the back there and that light's gonna reflect back to our eyes, right? These are things that we understand. Um, what then happens is the light is physically going through our pupil, right? We have some literally physically entering inside of our body um, and resting an image in, into our mind, into our entire like internal landscape. And that is super insane to me. I think that's absolutely incredible. Um, and I think that's really, really important um, for me to recognize that in terms of a way of connecting to the world, right? When I see a flower, um, as I am seeing in this photo, that process is happening and that flower is existing inside of the container of my eye. Um, so uh, Thich Nhat Nan, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, he talks, he writes about mindfulness, right? And um, he, for those who are unfamiliar, um, he's described as a Zen master, but he's a, a Buddhist who is um, well respected and celebrated in terms of understanding mindfulness and ways of, of living. Um, and so within um, his writing on mindfulness, specifically in his book titled The Miracle of Mindfulness, which I have right here, um, he talks about achieving moments of non-discrimination mind. And when he describes that, he describes it as a wondrous communion in which there is no longer any distinction made between subject and object. And when I read that description personally, it really resonated with me as a person who's out in the garden every day. Um, it really felt like it was articulating things that I was experiencing. And for me, when I'm deeply present in the garden, I forget about my body. This isn't happening all the time, right? And also I'm practicing to be present, but I forget about my body and I'm not thinking, I'm fully sensing the world around me and I'm looking and I'm being present. Um, and so in this way, the flower that I may be looking at, it's inside my eye, but also if we think back to this non-discrimination mind um, as an example of another possibility, um, maybe there is no distinction between those two objects. Um, me and the flower to begin with, and there's a unity already present when that total focus is there. Um, and so, like thinking about that, if we jump a little bit back to the physical examples of input that I've talked about, um, specifically like putting food in one's mouth, taking that food up in, into your body, into your weight, into your person, um, and then in a perfect world of kind of being tapped into the cycle, right, of being totally connected, we would then like excrete that back out into the world and it would be maintained in the cycle and it would eventually come back around. Um, and so that has had me questioning, like, what is, what is the spiritual equivalent of that? What is the metaphysical cycle and how am I participating in that? Um, and that is a big question. And that is a question that I'm thinking about a lot. 
um, in terms, and I think it really connects back to scene and sensing specifically. I don't think that we need to have vision to have these experiences. Um, but so my question then is if we are inputting this natural world into our body, right? In the same way we might like eat a vegetable, what is the transformation that it, that it, that happens to it when it's inside of us? Um, and what does it look like when it comes back out? I think that one of the examples that I really think about a lot is like depicted in this image, this um, little drawing that I made here. And we kind of have this, like this man out in the garden, maybe he's a goat, I don't know. Um, and he is like looking at some flowers and just like has the biggest like exclamation of like glee on that face, right? And we can maybe expect maybe there was like a, like a, like some form of like language explanation, like, wow, or like maybe um, the body like experienced shivers and maybe like his whole body was like, ah, oh, like trying to like, um, just like, just amazed, you know? And so, I think about that laugh, that big smile, that big, um, what I imagine is this audible expression. And for me, that's the flower coming back out. And I think that is, yeah, that's where I'm landing right now in terms of where I'm, how I'm thinking about my work. Um, and so um, going into that idea a little bit further, I then have to start, like for me, as it relates back to my practice, I really do think about like drawing as a potential um, or making work as a potential output as a result of this input from the garden that is resting inside of me. Um, in this next um, example of work that I've made, um, this particular work is called uh, Garden in the Womb of My Eye. And this work is, is it really demonstrates kind of what I'm trying to talk, what I just was trying to talk about to you all. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the project or about this work, and then I'll show a video that actually runs through it because it's a it has involves moving image. So it's just a short clip about it. Um, and so the part of the video that you're going to see in this film is actually the same exact is filmed from the same exact spot that I was sitting in two slides ago. So the orange sulfur cosmos that you see in the video, they are these exact flowers from this exact spot um a, a day after sitting in the spot and being like wow this is a really incredible spot i gotta come back um so um this was born um and the other part of this um sorry long slide um so yeah the other part of this is that the video is then projected onto a series of drawings that were made that summer in 2019. And so in the video, you might be able to hear some noises from the camera, which bring attention to focus, concentration, mindfulness. And there's an unusual dome shape that appears um, from the projection that appears like a window or at times an eye. And sometimes when there's a flower centered in there, it almost feels as if the flower center is the pupil. Um, and so quite literally, um, I'm just presenting what's, what was seen on top of what was created from what was seen. Um, and in a way, I feel that that cycle that I'm talking about has been completed and it can be started anew when someone else sees the work. Um, so I'm gonna share this video with you all and it's about 40 seconds long. So, um, so yeah, so that, 
that um, little that work I think really summarizes kind of how I'm thinking about this act of seeing, taking in, and then ex and then using that as a way of um, putting some form of an output. Um, I also just a small aside too. I really like the use of projection with drawing because I think that it activates it in a really incredible way that I think is really akin to the same way that like sort of dappled. Um, like forest floor light kind of activates that space too. I think there's some something happening related there, um, which I just think is interesting. Um, but we'll move on. So, um, so coming back to the start of this talk, I mentioned that I wanted to outline my role as an artist and I wanted to tell you about how I'm connecting to this multi-species world. Um, for me, my role is more than producing work about something. It's about producing work as both a means of connecting to the world in a deep and profound way and then existing as a part of it. And I think this is distinctly different um, than making work about, about something. My artwork is less about the garden, especially my drawings, and is more an extension of it a rebirthing of what I experienced through my senses. And so that is, I think, I think that sentence is the one that really outlines how I feel about what I'm doing out in the world. Um, and when I make a drawing in like my soft little romantic heart, I think about it as sort of like making or growing a flower in the same way. And so for me, this way of working gives me hope. It allows me to, um, to work not as a means of gaining capital and wealth, right? Producing like the next mega million dollar painting. Um, but instead I'm working um, and producing just by living. And it's a natural byproduct of living mindfully in the world that is around me. And my response is just to make work. That's just what I do. I can't stop doing it. <laughs> um, and so before, uh, I think we still have some more time and I wanted to run us through a little exercise of looking and seeing. Um, and so I have a series of drawings that I'm gonna show you. I think there are eight of them um, and they are from this past summer of working and they really came out of nowhere for me. Like suddenly my style of working really shifted and these drawings just poured out of me for two weeks and then they were done. Um, and these are the drawings that I'll be showing you. And then in addition to showing you those drawings, I'm gonna read a poem that I wrote that accompanied my thesis exhibition this past, um, this past winter. Um, and I think they pair really lovely together and a way that I think, yeah, I think there's something good happening in that pairing. So, and then following that, I'm just gonna show you a brief little clip of a film, or kind of a mashup of a film that I completed um, in 2020. So. First we'll look at images, hear words, and then we'll watch a little video and then we'll be done. Um, great. Uh, so I recommend getting into like a good comfortable posture so you can really focus. Um, but I'll read the poem and I'll give you some time to then look at the picture before I move on. So it'll be a nice casual rhythm. Um, cool. A human who is trying shouts to the garden. There is no question here. The marigolds sigh into the couch of the earth. There is still no question here. A tomato splits open with heat. I rub my knuckles. I am silly too. The onions glow. But not just silly. Dear sunflower, 
I am silly like you. And the sunflower, she smiles because she knows, best of all, how not to question. And as she completes simply being for the day, she sleeps. Sweet inside the mouths of bees, decayed along an excavation of worms, and floating, fragrant upon the stew of a heavy Tennessee sky. She has intertwined her body, loosed it into something large. I will do this too. And so, not knowing how, I do. Okay, that I like. Think at all for this. You got pistols on your heart. You got pistols on your heart. Thank you. Um, so there's time for some conversation, some Q&A. Great. You, I guess I'll keep this up in case there are questions related. Yeah, and then we could go back. That works. That totally works. Um, so folks who have questions can either unmute themselves and we can do the Zoom dance of trying not to talk over each other, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, and or you can uh, put questions in the chat. There's um, another option too. Um, and I have, I mean, I'll maybe to give folks a, a second to think. Obviously I wanna know about that ant piece. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 Can start with that. yeah. Can you start with that? And then I see, yeah, I see some questions in the chat. So yeah, start with that you, one. Are you interested in the process? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, definitely. Well, 
Yeah. Um, it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Um, I just tapped into my like um, little kid habits and started collecting a bunch of ants. Um, and yeah, put them in my mouth. <laughs> and just held them in there. Um, and it was really, yeah, the act of taking the jar filled with ants and then just putting it over my mouth and like tapping them all in, um, that was probably the most, um, probably one of the most intense parts of the whole thing for me, because once they were in my mouth and it was like, well, they're in there now, so <laughs> um, can't really do much. Well, you can do one thing about that. <laughs> Two, you know what you can learn about. Um, but yeah, so that was, and that was really just like, just being out in the garden all day and like spending time out there and just becoming really fascinated with, with just ants and just kind of led to that. I'm not really, yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, satisfying my curiosity. That's what I was afraid you would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel that. That's that great. Uh, I saw Blake had a question. What inspired you to have the same type of scheme in your paintings? Oh, okay. I think maybe like referencing like the sort of the style that exists there. Um, I mean, the I have not been, I mean, I used to draw a lot when I was little um, and I stopped as I got older and kind of just doodling in the margins. Um, but I read, I started drawing again back in grad school and it was kind of unexpected and not even a part of what I considered my artistic practice. And so that um, style, the line work originally came from working with watercolors and kind of the grace that can come with um, laying out those, um, those lines. Um, but I'd say that the style is just, it's, I mean, it's always changing uh, for me, but I think that they're like distinct, like things that I am drawn to keep repeating sort of symbols or so. One is like that five pronged, like spiky looking flower, um, hands, bodies, people. I'm really just, um, yeah. And I don't know that I've necessarily pushed very hard to develop a style more. It's kind of coming into itself, but it's developed a lot of texture and a richness of, a richness of texture um, over time. And I think that's directly related to working out in the garden and um, happy accidents, really, because I'm a messy, fast worker, and that's just how I how I make. So the accidents lead to a lot of things that stick. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, a thing I really enjoy about your work is this. You know, I mean, kind of the your um, organizing principle or perspective or interpretation of wilderness, right, and in which humanity and nature are are not um, kind of put into a dichotomy, right? You're bringing them together or acknowledging or suggesting to us viewers that they're more intertwined and um, than maybe we're accustomed to thinking. And I enjoyed watching in the work that you shared with us the way, especially the pieces where you were reading the poem with them, how, mm. um, but I think I've seen it in other aspects of your work too, where there's almost like this ambiguity between what's human and what's plant and what, you know, mm -hmm. that the forms begin to shift where, you know, initially, or maybe I was projecting this, but it felt like there was a progression in those where initially maybe the human and the, yeah, thanks, the human and the plants were more distinct, but towards the end, that prong aspect that you were talking about um, because the, where the lines were on the top of it started to read as like teeth to me and, and things like that. <laughs> Which one specifically was Yeah, that keep one? going through here. So I think, you know, you see the hands, oh, I'll go one then, right? Like how these, um, or I read those as like, you know, fingernails. And then here where they become, because they're connecting with something else, those spiky mm. things begin to look like teeth-like or appendage-like. Yes. Yeah. And I think of your process too, like how that the the materiality of your process where you're in the garden, like the piece where you talked about was done in, you know, in the garden. So the water pooled at certain places because it's being done on the ground mm -hmm. or especially in the piece where you're basically digging up, you're digging in the garden, you're doing a typical garden act, but instead you're using it to 
create a sculpture. So there's like a, um, a blending both in terms of like what you're representing, but in the process as well. I don't know. I don't have a question. It's just something that I um, No, that's interesting. And I haven't, for whatever reason, whatever you just said made me also think about how, um, like when I when I'm specifically drawing to, I'm usually using I mean I'm using a variety of things like pencils and whatnot, but often I also just rely on crayons. I mean it creates a sort of a resist, um, mm -hmm. and this idea of things being filled and how a thing can fill something and then take its own form and abstraction through that. I don't know that that made me think of what from what you're just saying, which I think is interesting and fruitful. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and Timon. You're still on. Earlier, Timon commented about um, when you were sharing the photographs with the uh, color flash, um, and and Timon remarked that your blending of your body with nature also helps move people past body phobias. Um, so I don't know, Timon, if you want to add anything to that, or if you just I concur. I think like if you maybe are intending or what you're uh, referencing is like, I don't know if bo body positivity is the right way, but like that it's beautiful. I think of the photo, the black and white photograph, um, at Lake, uh, at Lake Superior and you, I think you had a line, yeah, talking about like the back as like the sun, um, and just, <laughs> it was really kind of a lovely turn of, of phrase. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I'm not sure that if anything that I've set out for any like necessary positive body image, um, but I do think that there is something to be said about um, the fact that my body is like an, as a non-white body engaging with these wilderness spaces, I think is important. And I do like value that sort of representation because I think in natural spaces in the US, um, it's definitely, um, yeah, there's less, there's less space for people of color out there. Yeah, and I think, again, your, it's, it seems important that it's you putting your body um, in these spaces and in your artwork, rather than like, say, a model or something, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's both self portraiture, but also you are, it seems like through these pieces, like, enacting the very concept of the relationship between body and nature yourself seems to me significant, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And I think one thing that I struggled with in these photographic work or a criticism that I think is a fruitful one um, is that there's not like, it doesn't fit into this like idea of wildness in terms of um, an almost like a chaos and like this dirtiness and the bug bites and the dirt. <laughs> um, and things like that. So I think that that is, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit. Um, I'll just end it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't wanna, um, cause I have lots and lots of questions. So if there's other folks with questions, by all means, jump in or comments, observations. Hey, Ben. <laughs> I, uh, I was, gonna not ask a question because I have the luxury of seeing you more now that we're both in Columbus but uh, this is the first time that I've actually seen your work in a presentation style and you introducing your research alongside of it and it was really enlightening for me and I'm my question is specifically about your process and um, I know we've talked a lot about how um, intuitive your uh, drawing process is um, but hearing more about your research within these uh, connections between humans and nature, and specifically with this idea of the eye being a container instead of a cup. And when, when do these ideas like, enter the work for you? Is it mid-process or is it something that happens after the drawing is made? Mm, specifically, like that moment of of, of seeing something specifically? Or like when you're, when you're working on the drawing, do, you ha do these ideas come in to your head while you're making the drawing or the video 
or the photograph or is it something that you really like see the drawing yeah oh, okay yeah yeah so i think it i mean it comes from a lot of different places and it manifests in different ways but i think just just an example of recently i've been running along the olentangy river almost every day and um as i was sort of like descending this the, my favorite part of the run is where you take this staircase down um and suddenly you're not on the street anymore you're like in this like luscious green park um and so that's my favorite part of the run and it is so richly sensorial in the way that like you like just like walk down into this rich pounding like smell of earth and when the minute that i experienced like that moment of just like total absorption with it, it was like i gotta make a drawing and I, I didn't have an idea of what that would look like but i just went home immediately and just did it um, and it takes form from there. Sometimes I do have a, like an exact idea of what something looks like, um, but most often it is not how things turn out. Um, as I'm sort of, because the process is so much responding to its own self and specifically within the drawings. But um, yeah, so I think it takes shape in a few different ways. Sometimes it is more of like a vision of like, I don't want to use, I use the word vision very lightly here, but like just an image in my head and I tackle that. Um, and sometimes it looks very different, but yeah, I'm not sure, that wasn't very concise, but I hope that it answered your question a little bit. Thank you. Great. Um, Max typed a question in the chat. What is a body? Are there limits or borders to the body? And how does your art rethink or challenge the borders of interior and exterior or of skin, air, and dirt? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, it's one that I think about a lot, right? And I think that in some ways, and this is, I'm sort of thinking on my toes a little of things that I'm constantly thinking about and running with, but, um, but I think that, I think that in some ways, like even going back to like the word wilderness, right? I am here. I am talking about wilderness as a thing that just like it, it, it's like people are part of wilderness. But at the same time, in my head, I'm also like maybe it isn't just a matter of fact. Maybe it is a state of mind. Um, and so I wonder too if that relates back to how we view our bodies, right? I think that we can be in a moment where our body is totally closed off. And suddenly our world is just contained within that and we are closing ourselves off from interacting with anything else outside of us. I think that the reverse of that is also true where we are very open to experience and being felt by the dirt and having the dirt in our fingernails and kind of living in that moment. And I think in that moment, probably the moment where we are not even thinking about our bodies is the moment where we maybe are part of something greater than ourselves. Um, and that's how I would answer that this afternoon, anyways. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, it also, Max's question made me, um, and Max cont continues in the chat, felt by the dirt in which the dirt becomes the actor who feels and, <laughs> and feels. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a well-worded question. I, um, I don't, I don't know where the chat is right now. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there's a little like icon thing at the bottom of your screen, probably. Yeah, so he was just remarking that, uh, liking that phrase, I think that you said being felt by the dirt. So mm -hmm. the agency, right, like the dirt as the actor, as opposed to like us feeling the dirt, the dirt feeling us and that kind of like, oh, like, totally symbiotic or re reciprocal kind of thing. And I, Max's question was when we thinking about your, um, images the kind of like body process like wall hanging um mm -hmm. where there were this kind of like cut out moments with the stitched uh border as yeah. well right so we were and you were talking about i think as you were showing those images um this like awareness or interest in processes of like digestion or you know you digesting um yeah. you know you said you said bugs now I can think about as the ant ant video. Um, but then also like you leaving bits of yourself um in the garden too. And so in a way the garden is ingesting you as much as you're ingesting or 
Yeah, I like that language, being ingested by the garden. That's <laughs> beautiful. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't have a question with that. That just made me think of, um, Max's questions made me think of these pieces. Um, okay, one more, gar one more garden, one more question for me, and I'll try and uh, stop. But since you're talking about wilderness and your work is focusing a lot, not exclusively on the garden, but a lot, like there were the the photo pieces you showed earlier, were, which were more like kind of wilderness type pieces, but I'm curious what your thinking is in your work about, you know, the difference between garden, which is a cultivated, you know, it's kind of understood as like a cultivated uh, space mm -hmm. and has, of course, like a long uh, history, human culture versus like wilderness, which we think of as an uncultivated space or something that is not controlled by humans. Um, mm -hmm. How are you, are you kind of, does wilderness like encapsulate all of that? Or how are you thinking about um, a difference between those spaces? Yeah, well, I think cultivation is interesting to consider when we think about wilderness um, in terms of, yeah, is a cultivated forest still wilderness is in the same way a garden is or whatnot. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, my, I think it's important to bring up that like other, other creatures are influencing the system um, and helping to maintain it or break it down. Maybe they're an invasive, whatever it might be, um, part of the cycle. And I think that um, I, I just really question like if our influence, like what about our influence, I guess is the question that this is leading me to. What about, our, what about our influence is tainting something, right? If we, um, if, and if we were to like cultivate it in a positive direction versus like a less, less positive, is there a difference there? Yeah, they're all big questions. But for me, like the wilderness is, is encompasses everything. Um, I don't, and it's a little extreme to be like, yes, this like refined like cell phone is part of wilderness. I do think so in my heart of hearts. That's what I believe. It's just like we've really mastered refining our environment um, and manipulating it. But I think it's still there. Like all the pieces are still there and all those pieces come from everywhere else. Um, that is wild. So that's how I would think, that's how I'm thinking about that question right now. Anyways, yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, you started your presentation talking about physical ways to enter the garden and then you touched a little bit of, about that again when you were answering Max um, and the, the, the different ways that the ecosystem, we, we relate with, within the um, ecosystem. And I also see those many ways that you embody that within your actual art pieces where there's um, images of plant material and images of body parts. And I also saw the teeth that um, Jennifer saw. It, was, it had a blue blue on the top and then the white teeth, it was towards the end. Um, so I see those images of body parts infused or intertwined within that natural setting. I th it was beyond that one. Oh, beyond. Blue. I think it was towards the end. Um, but, but I wonder if you ever look back on any of your art pieces mm -hmm. and think that they could still um, grow or experience rebirth or become seeds for your future work. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's one um, that I am encountering right now, I think. I'm like in this phase where I worked a lot over the summer. I made a lot of work um, and to a point where I didn't even process all of it, it just kind of, it just was created. And now I'm filtering through and deciding what can work together to create a more cohesive, like collective um, presentation of the work and hopefully experience. Um, and in that, I do encounter work all the time that feels like it hasn't, it didn't, it didn't do the thing. <laughs> and have and you so, ever gone back and taken work and incorporated it into a future piece. Yeah, definitely. I think that that is happening probably all the time for me. 
Um, and a lot of it's unintentional. Sometimes it is very intentional. Um, and there are ways right now that I'm thinking about how my, like, because I used to really heavily focus on self-portraiture um, and I haven't touched that for a while. It's not necessarily like dead to me, but I might go, I might go back to it and I'm still fond of it. But those images, I were really foundational to my understanding of the figure. So I have thought about like, what would it be like to work with those images in terms of how I think about um, like directly, like pulling one of those images and then making images or drawings based off of that or using the shapes from that. I do think about that and I think that could be an exciting future thing that I do investigate, something I think about. But yeah, I think that that is definitely happening. And the idea that, yeah, because sometimes sometimes the idea is or what I want is in the work, but it, there's something blocking that maybe and I feel like I need to let it out. But usually it it's a while before I come back to something because I'm in such a state of like, okay, this is this one's done, moving on. And I just don't really think too much and I'm just going on to the next thing. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, Peregrine put a comment uh, in the chat. It says, fun garden coincidence. I had seen orange sulfur cosmos in my neighborhood, except I didn't know what they were. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the seeds from them, I labeled them mystery neighbor seeds. Glad to know what they are now. <laughs> oh good, I'm so glad. They will take over, um, but it could be a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> could be re Cultivating, cultivating your own. They're easy to weed out, but yeah, they're essentially weed for me now. But um, yeah, I love them. They're beautiful. So they're so pretty, and the seeds are so spiky. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, they have a really like yeah. They're it's like a little bundle spike ball of seeds, and then you can peel them off one by one. It's really yeah. That's yeah, so <laughs> I have some in my pocket. Oh, <laughs> I was gosh. walking by there and picked up more. <laughs> yeah, you should get them all. Go back and get them all. <laughs> That's great. Um, I don't know if Justin is still here, but um, if you are, Justin, did you want to say more about the comment that you put in the chat? Sure. I was just intrigued by the, the ant concept and the ways in which the artist David Wojnarowicz used ants to show the, to draw the distinction between um, the ways in which he, the natural world and the ways in which humans sort of act in these um, mechanistic ways for him ants were not the natural world in some ways mm. the, yeah, human, the human uh, yeah the human um uh sort of industrial revolution and and at the same time represented actual ants and mm. the natural world and so he has some images with ants crawling on things most notably an ant crawling on a crucifix which he was wrapped condemned for by the Catholic Church, but what he's really trying to say is like, we shouldn't be mechanistic about our religion. Um, and so there's really, there's some very visual similarities between the way you use the ants in that, in the image, which I think it's more with his reckoning towards the natural world, uh, mm -hmm. but the sort of duality of what, what ants can mean because they have this re very regulated society and yet they're part of the natural world. So so yeah, that's by the, the visual parallels between what you're producing and what he produced in the 1980s. Yeah, and um, what was the name of the artist that you mentioned? Sorry, it's David Wojnarowicz. Um, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and um, you know, I, I'm I'm a huge fan of his. Yeah, incredible artist. Really profound work. Yeah, and so I was, I was just just the way you presented the the image of the mouth and the, the face and the ants very much like his images of the ants crawling over clocks and crucifixes and monies and all those kind of things, except your image is more natural and more human. And so um, I, just, I just felt a resonance there. Great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Justin. All right, are there any 
final burning burning questions comments oh i also did um put my contact info here Great. um so if anyone does have like questions that they want to email feel i would love to answer them or you just want to connect in any form that would be i'd be excited about that so all right well if there's no uh final questions if everybody would join me in thanking benedict for his time sharing these beautiful images with us i can guarantee if you're on the instagram uh it's a great <laughs> it's a great one to follow yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank you all. It's been a real pleasure and I really enjoyed it. And yeah, it's invigorating talking and sharing and all of this. So I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>